Welcome to the first artist presentation of 2021 of our Visiting Artists series. The Visiting Artists series is a collaboration between Cleve Carney Museum of Art, Fine Art, Photography, and Architecture programs at the College of DuPage. Today, we are very fortunate to have Misty Gamble give a lecture about her work. I had the pleasure of sharing a studio with Misty a few years ago when we were both residents at the New Harmony Clay Project and seeing her amazing work and process. Misty Gamble's life-size fragmented figurative ceramic sculptures and installations focus attention on issues surrounding femininity and challenge conventional standards of morality, normacy, and propriety. Misty has been awarded residencies and fellowship at the Watershed Center for the Ceramic Arts, New Harmony Clay Project, the Armory Art Center, SACI Florence, Hambridge Center for Arts and Sciences, and Vermont Studio Center, among others. Gamble is the co-founder of Studio Nong, international sculpture co collective and residency program which travels to China and the US, focusing on clay figure figurative sculpture. Misty is an assistant professor of art at West Texas A&M University. For those of you who are listening in the YouTube live premiere of this lecture, please put your questions in the live Q&A chat box. Misty, thank you so much for being with us today, and I will turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Marina. That was a wonderful introduction, and I'm so happy to see you again. This is like such a pleasure. Um, I'm just gonna turn on my presentation here. So uh, as Marina said, um, my work very much relates to issues surrounding womanhood. So that's like a, a large topic. Um, I do look to some issues relating to feminism, and that's some of the stuff that we'll talk about later in the presentation. Um, the work that I'm going to show you in the beginning is a series that I did. Oh, goodness. I think this was my, yeah, this was my, my uh, MFA uh, thesis work. So I'm going to work my way through, almost in chronological order, some of the bodies of work that I've developed over the last, gosh, almost 13 years. And you'll see full body structures and you'll see some installations. Um, you'll see fragments, and I put a little information in about the Studio Nong International Sculpture Collective, which Marina mentioned. And by the way, if we didn't talk about this, I am a sculptor that uses clay. Um, so most of the work, all the work you're going to see is primarily ceramic. And most of the finishes, too. I mostly work with ceramic finishes and surfaces. So this work is called Nellie Has Scissors. She uh, was part of a body of work called Sweet Terror, which was comprised of six uh, bad girls or naughty girls caught in a single moment in time. They are life size and scale, and again, entirely ceramic. Uh, each of them carries this uh, object of weaponry, um, and the weaponry or the object that you will see with these naughty girls is rendered realistically. And the body itself is very much uh, rendered or uh, surfaced in sort of a uh, uniform look. And I worked my way through different colors. Um, and we'll see that in the next in the next work. So Maddie Matches uh, is, uh, let's see, I sort of thought about this work as like, um, like a child that had an ungoverned id. I looked to research on sociopathic children that lacked empathy. And so what I was doing was very much thinking about propriety and appropriateness and behavior. So again, the, the surface of the body has this like all over uniform rough quality, which was very, I was thinking about like at a Rodin-esque, like highly gestural surface, but again, the object of weaponry, very like realistic in form. And again, life size. So um, this one is called Precious. And like when I was making these children, I was thinking about different references. I was reading um, a book uh, called Strewell Peter, 
um, which was all about cautionary tales for children. And then I was also looking at things like 1956 Bad Seed and other vintage horror movies like Children of the Damned. And a lot of their uh, their pupils, the way that they were sculpted or re rendered was like a pinhole eye. So it made it look just really like scary. So I started thinking about, again, vintage horror movies, sociopathic children, like children gone awry, like psychologically sort of losing it. And so I keep being asked, uh, like, what was this glove things about? And again, realistically rendered and much smaller. And then her feet and her legs were just like more grotesque. And like, so I started thinking about things like the grotesque or abject and things being sort of like beautiful and ugly at the same time, where color would pull you in and make you want to look at the children. But then when you got closer, you realized that the surface almost looked dirty or cruddy. So there was a back and forth for me that I was always playing with. Also, I started thinking about age. And so the children started looking much older. So there was this fine line between adulthood and, and childhood. Like, are they adults doing childlike things and poses? Or are they children, you know, like behaving in like terrible adult ways? So, you know, again, dealing with those sort of polarities. Um, thinking about uh, children <laughs> and hair too. I started getting interested in hair in, uh, while I was doing the series, but I started thinking about the Little Miss contest quite a bit. And I found a Little Miss contest in Florida called La Petite, which I thought was sort of fascinating. So this Little Miss uh, character who had a really squished face. I almost made the faces more caricature. So again, fine line between caricature and naturalism or realism was also where the children laid or lied um, and their faces were squished and caricature, but then they would have like enormous bouffant sort of adult hair. And uh, this one was La Petite Vertu, which was um, Little Miss Virtuous. But in fact, there was like a flip-flop of meaning because it was, La Petite Vertu. So she was like the most virtuous, but at the same time, she had the smallest amount of virtue. So I was like playing with words too. And again, life, life size. Um, who could not um, refer to Willy Wonka too? Like, so all of these sort of references started coming up when I was thinking about bad children. So I started um, researching, what was her name? Bo, uh, uh, Violet Beauregard. And so this became a work that was an homage to Violet Beauregard. And I kept thinking about bulbous, so volumetric, like uh, uh, sphere forms, like where you see that in the, in the feet and you see that in the head and her body. And um, this work is called Fatso. So almost these children like covet these objects at the same time, but they're very much okay and empowered in their largeness. So they're not apologetic about being obese. So I saw the work over time as I was building all these figures. I was like, what is this even about? And I realized it was about like being a strong woman. And, and that, that in, in itself was what the work was about. So she was like hoarding, but unashamed. And at the same time, I wanted to like think about vintage color palettes and uh, like vintage motifs, vintage clothing, vintage objects, like the hostess fruit pie. Um, okay, this is Betsy after school. You can't see her whole body, but she's seen sort of relaxing after school with roller skates on. You'll see that in the next slide. Overeating, comforting herself in tight clothings, almost to say that the clothing is squeezing the children, like as if the environment itself is making the children do bad things. And this is like this, uh, this green color. I use color almost uh, symbolically as like a sickness where the where the inside is turned outward and the sickness is happening because of the like pressure of the clothes pushing in. So this is five of the six children all displayed in an exhibition on plinth. Um, and I thought about overall this color palette um, as being almost like Fred Flintstone's vitamins thrown across the room chalky and dry, distasteful, but at the same time sort of sweet and delicious. 
And then also these colors that were uh, reminiscent of like another time, like a Russell Wright plate collection was something I was also looking at. So that was like one body of work. Um, moving on, there's another grouping of a body of work uh, that I started doing almost directly after that work. So I still wanted to work with uh, full body structures and uh, life-size uh, work. So the last body of work was almost like children that look like adults. So what I started wanting to do is make adults that looked younger. So I started thinking about cosmetic enhancement um, and many different things came up about this work. I wanted the women to sit and pose as though they were the object of themselves and that merely their posing and being there was like almost, yeah, like them being the object themselves. I'm being redundant, but okay. So the third one that I actually built out of this three series um, sculpture, uh, a series of sculptures was the one in the middle. Um, when I started sculpting this, I got up to the top of the figure and I almost felt like if I put on the arms, it would compromise the integrity of the form. So I was making these silhouettes or torsos that felt a lot like stewardess torsos, or they reminded me of dress forms or Barbie dolls or, or what occurred to me later after I finished this work is that that stump form, the middle of the body, the torso, reminded me of the David Lynch movie called Boxing Helena. And it was a reference that I kept using and going back to, to just create this form without legs and without arms. And that was this work in the middle, although it seems awkward, was sort of a launching place for me to then make more work. And that's often how my work is. Like I'll go from this to that and that informs me and then I move on. So in reflection, thinking about this work, I started thinking about a lot of things like, well, cosmetic enhancement, like is that ultimately empowering or disempowering? And third wave feminism and body autonomy, that we are able to do these things to our body and it is our choice. And so I was thinking about body positivity or body neutrality and what like all of these ideas were sort of going into this work. I called it the Chanel series too. Um, and the color itself um, related to the colors of Chanel uh, suits. So I like doing a lot of research into color and thinking about it. And this is another example of that. Okay, um, and this was actually done at a different residency after I did that Chanel series, which did have a, a lot more work to it. I'm just sort of like putting some significant um, works into this presentation to show you sort of the ideas I was thinking about. I often go to residencies and wanna um, research new ways of making uh, new content, um, new form, new shape. Um, and I was super interested at this time to sort of move out of large scale figures and move into fragmentation of the figure, multiplicity, mixed media, and slip casting. So I developed projects at my residencies just to be able to use that. And it started the ideas, like the ways in which I was building very much related to the content of the work. And so I started to match very much my strategies with content. So I saw this fragmentation of the body, like parts making a whole as one of my emphases is for, emphases for, for developing work. Um, so, I started thinking about the word accoutrement and accessories and status symbol. A lot of this work was made actually at West Palm Beach at a residency I was at where many of the students that I was working with were from Palm Beach. So I started like making work that related to like where I was at. So this work was called Tan Hands. It started from this point on sort of comp contemplating these ideas of wholeness and fragments of the female form. Though there was an inkling of that with that one piece that I just showed you where I stopped putting arms on. Um, so let's see what, oh, this is another work that I made when I was at that residency. So again, slip casting multiples. So this piece is comprised of, oh, eventually it might've been like 250 uh, shoes or so. I kept repeating the work and making more shoes. Um, each shoe, is entirely unwearable um, as there were no pairs and there were ceramics. Um, 
I love the idea of starting to make intimate spaces. So this is a space that was sort of like a woman's intimate space, like a closet or a bathroom or a, like a bedroom or someplace that was hidden. Um, and it talks about these ideas also that I'm still super interested in, like excess and consumption and too much is never enough and um, vintage wallpaper and molding. And these colors represented uh, April in Palm Beach, which was the time I was there, like spring springtime in Palm Beach. And here's a close up. So if you look closely here, you can see a logo. Um, I started thinking about the idea of branding myself and that Myself as an artist, maybe I wasn't an artist, I was a product maker. So I was thinking about commodification of art and branding myself. And I was Misty Gamble from West Palm Beach. And so I started thinking a lot about like West Palm Beach versus Palm Beach and like hearing stories about how different times of the year, like when there was a hurricane in West Palm Beach, they raised the bridges so that you'd separate the West Palm Beach people from the Palm Beach people. And just like hearing these stories, I reflected on it by making myself a cobbler that lived in West Palm Beach. And again, thinking of myself as like a, like a product maker or something. Okay, so this was one of many pieces that I made where I was just creating the bust or the torso or the stump or the legless armless form that held up ginormous um, like uh, coiffures of hair and the hair would be so large that it would cover the ability to see, but the gaze in the work was still unapologetic. Um, and that the, 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 the hair was actually the main actor and that the bust itself operated like mainly as an armature, almost to hold up the action. But that at the same time, you can see a little bit of the nose coming out there. The female form can still breathe. It's as if to say that the coiffure or the accoutrement or the accessory and the beauty is so significant um, that the rest of it is almost unimportant. Okay, so this is a body of work of a number of pieces that I created when I was back in Kansas City. And what I'll do is I'll work in series and make a lot of different pieces over time that'll fit into sort of a body of work. And then I like sort of shifting and doing new research and developing new work. And so that's been going on for like, you know, anywhere from like two to six years, I'll work on sort of like a body of work. Um, here you can see, I was sort of bringing these ideas together of like multiplicity, casting, mixed media, these dress forms, the hair interest, and then continuing to use objects as symbols for um, status or things that we cover, covet or things that are like overly cute. And it's a little bit of like, you know, it's, it's, I'm being critical about it. Um, but at the same time, I wanna use objects that people adore or that culturally are adored. Um, super interested, super interested at this point in creating, I mean, if you wanna call them installations or not, but spaces, I guess they are installations, spaces that are created where a figure sits in front, the viewer engages and behind the figure is some sort of theatrical device, be it a curtain, uh, a curtain of cupcakes that hangs from the ceiling, be it uh, like, paintings that are actually three-dimensional or wallpaper series that are three-dimensional or high relief wallpaper out of ceramics. And so I started thinking about those devices, like a two-dimensional object behind as a theatrical device and a three-dimensional figure in front. And sometimes people can even walk all the way around and become engaged in it. And that those things are multiplied, like, I don't know, I think this is 450 cupcakes and boxes. Um, and again, using the cupcake as an object of consumption or a status symbol or an overly cute object or um, like a fetish object to fetishize a cupcake. Um, and working with these objects to then make the object themselves um, create the body. Like it's a body made out of that which it covets. 
And specifically, I have to mention this artist's name. At one point during this work, I was making all of this work and I came across a Julie Heffernan painting and it all made sense. I felt like I wanted to <laughs> make Julie Heffernan paintings come alive um, within uh, in, in ceramics. Okay, so here's a close up. Um, right here on the left, you can see the logo. Again, operating with these ideas of like making me uh, be a brand, be the person that was the cupcake maker. So again, taking on identities like, am I a cobbler or am I a cupcake maker? And working with cuteness. Well, at the same time, it wasn't very cute. This, um, the heads too, as you can see here on the left became, um, they became removable to say like a Barbie doll, to say, or a Santos doll. Uh, the Spanish speaking Americas. It's almost to say like this head can come out of this body and stick on another body and they can be all be reversible and it doesn't matter. So um, sometimes my strategies for stacking and modularity lend to the content. And I'm particularly interested in that. I watch for strategies for building relating to content a lot. Um, okay, so moving on uh, very quickly, I also realized at this time I was more interested in than the hair than anything. And I just wanted to sculpt hair. So um, wigs inspired by the 50s and uh, French revolutionary era um, Marie Antoinette hairstyles um, uh, were sculpted. And uh, with these gigantic hoop skirts that I was building with this work, um, I was, you know, you know, looking towards the French Revolution era. Um, and thinking about that aesthetic. Uh, here you see again, the two dimensional like framing device and then um, just the very top of where the Santos doll or the Barbie doll head would be without the body. And then using uh, filigree and, uh, and roses as a stand in for hair. So just taking out hair completely and using other things. Also very interested in the idea of using um, the surface of the ceramic form as a canvas, going back and forth between two-dimensional and three-dimensional approaches. I continue to be fascinated by that. And here you see that again. Um, I researched some um, French revolutionary era uh, textiles and came up with these, what I refer to as wallpaper patterns, and then applied those to the surface of the ceramic object. And again, this one has like a removable head. Hair so large, it hides the ability to see. In quick presentations, I say it's lickable, likable, delicious, delectable, eatable, edible. Because the work itself, I wanted it to be delicious. I wanted it to be something that you wanted to engage with where the abject was hidden in content, but at the same time, the work was so like aesthetically beautiful in some way that you wanted it to be edible. <laughs> okay, so again, we see more patterning and stripes here um, and the very cupcakes themselves being the hair. Um, I love this idea of the pedestal being the extension of the figurative form. I've been working with that for a while. And um, let's see, moving on to panties. Um, this was a project, um, this is life, these are life-size panties. I'll get a close up too, so you can understand a little bit closely, more closely what I'm doing. Um, I used them as a device for it to almost, I mean, it's dimensional, you'll see in the next image, but I wanted it to look like a painting and there's some um, stripes behind it to give it a grid. This work is called Sunday. Um, seven panties down and seven to the side would mean that that was one work, one one year's worth of Saturday night panties, sort of abandoned, um, seen in a different orientation, and then interior is bedazzled. So it's like, again, the, the way that I made this, which is slip and dip, or what I refer to as burnout, um, the panty was once there, and then it was encased in clay, and it was burned out almost as if there's a memory of what happened, and that still exists. And then it was flipped on the wall where all the panties were abandoned, walking one direction, and then bedazzled. 
Okay. And here's one more of these pieces. Um, this one was <laughs> um, a body made out of uh, chihuahuas. And what you see behind the work is what I refer to as chihuahua wallpaper. So uh, part of the chihuahua or the full, uh, you know, chihuahua body is on the wall, um, creating a patterning effect. Um, and again, the covetous uh, symbols complete the figurative form. And then at the same time, reference an absence of body. Here is a close up of the chihuahuas, I think there are 150 chihuahuas. Yeah, I individually cast them, multiple parts, put them back together, and, and then fired all these individual chihuahuas and then compiled them um, both on the wall and in, with the body. Um, I started working with wedding cakes too, and I felt like this one was complete without creating a large uh, figure for the wedding cakes to be within. So this one was called Forevermore. Um, they are, it is, this is a quite large piece actually. Um, individually made, they were actually once fired. I was trying out new technologies. I wanted to do porcelain slip casting once fire with sprig molds and slip trailing. And I did. so. The, um, the lilac or the lavender color was representing um, the iconic like bridesmaid. And I was also referencing um, Wedgwood and they were flocked on one side. Let's see if I can get more images. Yep, I have another one there. And then I used this paint called Ralph Lauren gold for the um, sort of ribbon like things. And it was a big wall work. Okay, so moving on, I'm still fascinated with these panties and I've been making these panties for some time. I continue to make them. They're actually on, a, on display in, in the gallery here at school right now. Um, I was just unable to retire the, the image and um, it's actually very much relating to the work that I'm doing right now. So I made more of an, an amorphous scattering. Um, the panties are displayed, undressed, uh, abandoned and displayed as if the body was walking and undressing on multiple Saturday nights in a pile. Uh, I talked a little bit about it being like a memory or a residue of what once was. I also thought of it as like an imprint and um, the topography um, represented like the body in its absence. So the inside of the work was the body where it once was. Um, uh, and then I worked with some more specific ornamentation or um, bedazzlement where it got much more specific. So those rhinestones are put on like with little you like tweezers, really, really specific. Uh, and you see these ideas that I'm working with, which are like beautiful and grotesque. And I like to go back and forth with that. I have some images here next about the Studio Nong um, International Sculpture Collective and Residency Program that I've been a part of for some time. And um, it's a, a little bit of background. It's a, it's a group that uh, from the Guangxi Arts Institute, originally the Kansas City Art Institute and the Memphis College of Art with a number of members, both in China and in the United States. And we would meet together and work on projects in China and in Kansas City and Memphis, China a couple of times actually, where we did this exchange where we learned from each other like different strategies in making essentially. And most of these gentlemen that you see, Ji Gong, Zheng Hai, Shang Wu and Bang Men, most of them did not really speak English. Um, some, I think they learned a little bit over the time we, we, um, we worked with them, but our communication was mostly through the work that we made. And it was surprising just how much everybody can learn by like not speaking the same language and just working through art. So the center of our connection was this clay and study of form and technology figuration. And then um, we studied a lot of uh, what they refer to as shufa or calligraphy. So that was the US gang. Oh, we would also get together for either, our residencies were either for four weeks or for six weeks. And sometimes we would, even if we had a six week residency, we only had 18 days approximately to make work. We often built 
uh, in a fashion which was in ceramics we refer to it as solid building. So you can build work really fast and then hollow a lot out if you have a lot of assistance. So we would go through sometimes like 7,500 pounds of clay in 18 days with eight people and then finish the work, let it dry out and then fire it and have an exhibition. So we did some incredible feats, like, like working really fast with teams. Um, so I'm just gonna take you through some of these, uh, these images. This is when we were back at the Kansas City Art Institute in the ceramics department for the summer of 2015, yeah. Uh, what was also interesting was working this fast, the ideas just had to come fast. You had to resolve things within one day, like one night you would leave a work and then the next day you would come back and resolve it. So sometimes not even being able to finish a work the way that I wanted to, I would just come up with these really fast like strategies to finish a work by just like smearing clay all over the face. And sometimes like some of these works, I look back at them now and they were just like some of the better works I've made, like things that happen really fast where you make decisions, where you, almost where you don't hold yourself up, like you step aside and let the magic happen as opposed to like laboring over decisions that are aesthetic or technical. Um, I was very much uh, like very much an administrator and um, organizer. This residency almost took me two years to plan and create the funding for. Um, I did public relations development, archiving, exhibition, writing, fundraising, budgeting, um, outreach, implementing. I was, uh, I recruited and hired and managed teams of translators when they came to the United States. Um, program manager, work study positions. We developed an internship program and opportunity as many of the students went back with us to China the following year. Um, it was really an incredible project. Oh yeah, we all worked together to learn all sorts of things. So here you can see um, Zhen, Zhenhai, Zhenhai He is his name. And this was a work that I built really big, uh, like a really large work. So that means when you have that much clay, you just see it as an opportunity to do things that you wouldn't usually do. So it was quite lovely. Um, and this continues to be an ongoing exchange with these gentlemen, let's see. Oh, when I went to China the next year, I decided I wanted to do some new work that related to flexible molds. And so I came to China with um, these flexible uh, molds and I made like press, I pressed clay into the molds. So I had a mother mold and flexible uh, molds and I pressed it in and I like, I made all this work and I used, I used rubber bands. So this was the work that I was talking about that I said, sometimes I make work and like interesting things happen just because I have to make a work and finish it within like three days or something. Um, I made a lot of like fragments of figuration out of my head too, without a model. Um, and this one was out of, without a model too. Um, for Studio Nong, we usually have a model at some point during the residency, which is really nice because I like continuing those like sort of classical studies where I'm actually working with life sculpture. Okay, so that stuff's 2015, 2016, and then new work. So I, I've been thinking about all of these new ideas that I'm interested in. And so this is about when I met Marina, I started thinking about this new stuff. And really this new work that I started thinking about came out of um, a book that I read, The Sexual Politics of Me by Carol J. Adams, um, which had been around for some time. I just hadn't heard about it. And uh, the book discusses the sort of these intersections between the meat eating and the patriarchy and between vegetarianism and feminism. I think at this point when I read the book, I'd been a, a vegan maybe for a year. And um, I just, it, it was like everything was coming together. My interest in animals and feminism and hair. And I'd been ch sculpting chickens for some time. And I was thinking about this work and meat and exploitation of animals and women, objectification of women, and just like all this stuff. And I was thinking about all of these things and I read this book and it was all sort of coming together and I didn't know how to make um, 
work about it. But since I've read this book, I've been trying to make work based on these ideas that I became interested in. So some of these ideas, um, let's see, related to this idea that I loved called uh, the absent referent. So that was a term that Carol J. Adam, Adams um, came up with. I, I was also like this, this idea of intersectionality came up. So I'm just gonna read here. Like intersectionality is a concept often used in critical theories to describe the way in which oppressed institutions are interconnected and cannot be examined separately from one another. So you hear this word, it was very much used um, with uh, the idea of feminism and black women and, and but vegans started using this word to talk about um, the commonality and oppressed systems that were used with animals and with women and talking about the connection between those two things. So I started thinking about all these things. Um, also intersectionality is a framework that attempts to identify how interlocking systems of, empower, uh, of power impact those who are most marginalized in society. So I started like relating that to animals and animal agriculture. Um, animals and animal agriculture have become absent reference through language. That's one way that Carol J. Adams talks about the absent referent. So the absent referent um, sort of erases the animal. So originally it was a cow and then it becomes beef. So it's like erased. The animal too is erased in that it was once alive and then it no longer is and it's packaged and, and it sits on a styrofoam in plastic in a, like in a refrigerator case at the store. So the animal in a way becomes an absent reference um, because they go from like a live animal to a food product. So Carol J. Adams kept bringing up this idea about the absent reference all the way through the book. And I thought that had so much to do with so much of the work that I make or the way that I think, maybe not that I, the way that I think about women in general or society, but the way that I was thinking about my work, like things disappearing, but still yet referring to them. So um, these ideas that Carol J. Adams talks about in, in overlapping feminist and vegan, she refers to it as the vegan critical theory um, she discusses deanimation, fragmentation, and objectification. And those three words really stood out to me. I was thinking about women being deanimated, how I was deanimating the female form constantly with hair and covering it, how I was fragmenting things. And I was using like objects of status and cuteness and bodies as objects and objects. So anyways, it so resonated with me that I've just been like, and I still continue to think about these things and how I want to pull them into my work. Um, so there we go. I'm going to move on to just show you some images that I also, these might be a little provocative, but there were things that like, again, resonated with me with this new research I was looking at. So um, this is a very, I should say infamous uh, Hustler cover, um, Larry Flint, put this on a cover in 1978, and it featured a woman being fed into a meat grinder. There's a lot of, um, inter they, they're referred to as pro-intersectional vegan feminists um, that talk about um, ads like this and things that PETA are doing where they're using almost like sexism to promote veganism. So this sort of resonated with me too, this sort of imagery that I was looking at and all of this went into some new work that I made while I was uh, at that residency with Marina. Since then I've made more work, but um, I also started looking again at color um, and color palettes to appropriate. And I looked into the David Hockney pool painting series to appropriate color. I was thinking about Los Angeles and pools being sort of like an iconic city for, um, objectification or, and I come from Los Angeles. So like, like or uh, like an iconic city of vegans or just all of these ideas. I was thinking it was important for me to find something that made sense. And I just, I sort of really like blue. Huh. So these were the paintings I was looking at, pulling out color to put onto my chickens. Um, so 
I use, I started using the idea of the chicken and the panty to talk about like feminism and veganism. And um, I got back to doing um, like what I refer to as hollow building from the ground up, the inside out. Um, but these works uh, were built a little differently. I didn't plan them out. I sort of um, just wanted them to respond to what was happening. So as I built the work, the concavities and the convexities were being created, the flapper tails, the like, the bizarre sort of like aerodynamic car fin parts. You'll see in a second, I'll show you some more images. And all of these um, like forms that were being created were created in a response to what had already been created below. So I was building much more intuitively and I wanted to build these chickens and use them for a couple things like canvases or a silk screened panty motif. There's some photos of that. These, these chickens are like abstracted clearly. And I, I called them my Isama Noguchi chickens. So they, cause they looked very like postmodern and simplified. And they were also referencing sort of intersections of a woman, like a uh, space between her leg and thigh and upside down, I kept seeing like female body parts and fragments of a woman's body. Um, all of this uh, line work and shapes were all supposed to be just very like, uh, you know, sexy and seducing. Um, I thought a lot about chicken rooster and like gendering the chickens. I finally called the work Coco Vin because somebody said, so many people said that they were roosters and I kept thinking they were chickens or hens, but I used both male and female animal forms and looked to the comb to sort of talk about that. Um, so here's some more images of the like aerodynamic car fin tail. Uh, and then behind you can see more panties on the wall. So I wanted to start working more with like panties and uh, panty image on the chicken. Let's see if we can see more images. Um, fragmentation, objectification and deanimation in abstracting and naming animals as meat. And again, reiterating the absent reference. Oh, here's some images of the image transfer and silk screened ceramic material of panties. These little itty bitty panties you see were sculpted and then um, in form and then I photographed them. And then in Photoshop, I made them into a wallpaper design. And then that wallpaper design I made into a silk screen. And then with the silk screen, I did multiple printings with underglaze and ceramic material onto the surface of the chicken that operated as like a device for, you know, like, like a canvas. Again, pulling from other ideas that I've used in the past. Here's some close-ups of the surface on the chickens. I really thought of them as a space or a canvas for an abstract expressionist painterly surface to occur. That concludes the work uh, in this a uh, presentation. I have some more work I'm doing now because this was from a couple of years ago, but that sort of concludes what I was doing when I was working with Marina at the New Harmony Clay Project. So thank you so much. And um, let's see, Marina, um, back to you. Um, thank you so much for being with us today, Misty, and for taking the time to talk about your work. Um, we have a little bit of time for questions that students have submitted beforehand. The first question is um, about color and you've discussed color, but can you talk a little bit more about how the element of color play, plays a role in your work? Yeah, I did talk about that, but like, uh, yeah, do you see, you probably saw how I kept like mentioning like appropriations or symbol or like a color palette relating to history. I think, I don't think I mentioned the abject reverie. When I was building that abject reverie um, 
series two. I saw the the um, the Marie. What is that movie called? The Marie Antoinette actually was the name of the movie, and it, I think it was was it made by Sofia Coppola? Yeah. And I remember like how color played such an important part in that movie, and everything was like all about being delicious and playful and like sexual and political and all that like over the top of And I remember there was a whole color palette in that movie. And it wasn't like I completely stole that color palette, but I remember there was like some like deep bright maroons and some greens and then things were very light and pink and fluffy. So I started thinking about that movie um, being a, like playing a part. So like I was grabbing, you know, in Sweet Terror, I talked about the same thing. I was like grabbing from like Russell Wright plate collections and then Fred Flintstone vitamins. And I would actually go out and buy them because I remember eating Fred Flintstone vitamins. I remember how dry they were. So like I would steal colors from that. I would steal colors from like Willy Wonka and I would layer all this meaning on like when I first started being an artist and making all this work, I thought maybe I just had to research one area and stick to that. But I mean, I do take color. I take um, all sorts of research from different places. And then I sort of make it my own by like making it more complex and layering meaning. But essentially that's how I use color as one more formal device to create more meaning and more complexity. And I layer color, right? Um, like the uh, David Hockney pool painting uh, series, I sort of like flesh that out with the pool paintings. Like I, I talked about that a little bit about how I went to all of those paintings and I actually made, I was in the residency with you. I was making color swatches before you got there of all those paintings and picking out the particular colors to get like a mood or a feeling. And if people knew it was about David Hockney, I mean, they probably don't know. They can't look at the work and see that unless I tell people, but to me, it feels more layered or less like arbitrary that I'm just pulling colors out from whatever, but color, Color has always been a big part of my work, Marina, like can hands or, or like um, the chickens or abject reverie, or, I mean, you see it sort of like over and over. I also like bright colors, but then at the same time, some like dirtiness somewhere, some like in the crevices or things that look cruddy, but like color pulls you in because it's an easy trick, you know, like it's really easy. So it's accessible, pull people in and then have the darkness below. There's something a little bit fascinated with that. And like, again, it, it probably has a lot to do with like how I grew up, which is um, the daughter of a puppeteer, you know? So I was surrounded by like, by like highly accessible, you know, imagery and objects and theater and performance and color. And so pull people in but then have some cruddiness underneath. I hope that answers the question. Yes, absolutely, thank you. Um, there's another question uh, in regards to animals and we've, we've uh, seen some animal forms in your work. Um, has your representation and meaning of animals changed from early work to later work? Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to think of that, like with the work that I showed you in the presentation, because I've done animal stuff before or outside of the images that you saw, but within um, this uh, PowerPoint, I showed one piece with chihuahuas and then and the other piece at the end, of course, with the chickens that I referred to. Um, and I, I use the animal form very differently. And I think I use not only the body, um, the, the human animal, but the non-human animal very differently. And I like to approach it from different ways. So absolutely, it was a different representation in that work with the chihuahuas. So the, the work with the chihuahuas, let me think about this. The chihuahua itself is an object. It didn't have an individual personality. I multiplied it and it became just a stand-in for a body. Like it filled space and talked about the symbol of of status, like we understand that because we understand people walking around with little dogs, like there's a cuteness about it or a status or something. I'm always looking to status symbols that are sort of not what we're usually looking for, right? Like this, the ring was more of a status symbol that we understand, but the chihuahua, that was like a little tougher for people to see that as a status symbol. So it became a little bit more ambiguous, but the, the chihuahua itself was like a filler to, to fill in where the body wasn't the body made of, of the status symbol itself, of that which we covet. 
And then the chickens were abstracted, but like each one had an individual character. So I am interested in talking about these ideas like the ab absent reverent and the chicken and animal exploitation. So I'm giving them a personality. Um, and then I'm giving them the ability to express themselves as art objects to be canvases for other things happening like multiplied panties or abstract expressionist painterly physicality. So they are individual and I guess they're all life-size. I continue to be interested in life-size for some reason. Um, uh, so yeah, they, they're the representation of the uh, animal, non-human animal form is, uh, I, I approach them very differently. Thank you. Um, and you also mentioned scale. And so a follow-up question about scale. Many, if not most of your works are singularly large in scale or life-sized and repeated to make the large scale of the piece. Do you ever think you'll explore the smaller size and scale to convey similar messages you convey in your larger works? Yeah, well, I mean, the, fir the first answer to that is no, I'm not interested in making small work. I've tried and it, it just doesn't uh, appeal to my physicality. Um, I'm specifically interested in making large work. I like the idea of my body relating to the large work in an expansive way, as opposed to working with a miniature where I would have to go inward, I feel like. So I think as artists, we find things that relate to us. I have tried making small work for sure. Um, it, 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 it goes against how I feel like I, want to occupy space with my body, how I express myself, how I use my body, how I relate to the object and how I want to fill a space with the work and create environment. So making large work is about your body being immersed in the work. And I love that idea. And I have tried to make work that is more object-based or smaller or miniatures and for whatever reason that doesn't like resonate with me. If there was a purpose to make something small um, or make something small and multiply it for the sake of the project, I would because the sake of the project is uh, dictates the scale for sure. Um, I have been making some small things recently um, and multiplying them like the chicken body parts that I talked to you a little bit about. Um, that I'm going to multiply and put in these big uh, things that sit on top of heads. Um, and I'm also making some small-ish uh, maquettes right now. So small-scale studies I use a lot. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Misty, so much for being with us today. Uh, I want to thank everyone who joined us. Our next visiting artist event is a lecture by Paula Aguirre Serrano on March 17th at 11 a.m. And the following event is a panel discussion including Aaron Wiersma, John Sabro, and Terry Connard on April 22nd at 11 a.m.